Hello everybody. In this video I want to talk to you about regression analysis in particular uh, and particularly about how to use regression analysis for forecasting. So in the previous lecture we have looked at time series decomposition. Okay. Uh, we have come up with a uh, level y-intercept, a beginning uh, or starting value, a uh, starting point, and then we had a particular slope, and then we had uh, seasonality factors. Uh, and the question then is, are these good values? Or are these the best values? Okay. So, or how good are these values? So let's look at a few uh, lines okay, that we could fit. So these uh, data points are, actu are actual demand. And we're trying to estimate the trend line. Uh, we can fit multiple trend lines like this. Okay. Uh, and the idea is uh, which one is best in some sense, okay? Uh, which ones are better than others? Now the regression analysis gives you the, that answer, okay? So in the regression analysis, uh, you have a model, okay? And uh, this model de describes a relationship between uh, two variables. Okay? So a regression model uh, explains or describes how two things behave uh, with respect to each other. Okay. So a typical regression model looks like this. Uh, y equals alpha plus beta times x plus epsilon. Okay. So x and y are, are uh, variables. So uh, y is the dependent variable and x is the independent variable. Dependent, like y, y is y dependent and y is x independent. Now, in this relationship, okay, uh, there must be some association, some dependence, okay? If they were, if x and y were independent, completely independent of each other, uh, then we couldn't find a meaningful relationship between them. So in the regression analysis, we're trying to estimate uh, how much y depends on x. Okay? So uh, we're looking at y. We're trying to understand why y y increases or decreases, okay? y is not constant, y changes over time, okay? And we want to find out why our variable y uh, changes, okay? And our uh, hypothesis is that y changes because x changes, okay? So, x affects y. Okay, that's our hypothesis. Okay, so for example, you could uh, look at uh, soft drink consumption. Okay, so sometimes people buy more soft drinks, sometimes people buy less soft drinks. Okay, so, so the idea is why does soft drink consumption go up at certain times and why does it go down at certain times, okay? 
So it's in the sultry consumption is not constant, it varies. And our hypothesis is uh, something affects soft drink consumption. Uh, what, can, what can that something be? Uh, let's say weather temperature. Okay, so we hypothesize that uh, as weather temperature changes, as it becomes warmer or colder, the uh, soft drink consumption will also change. Okay, that's our hypothesis. So, regression analysis allows us to estimate how much the independent variable affects the dependent variable. Okay. Um, before I go further, here's a uh, word of caution. When you use uh, statistical models like this, math mathematical models like this, uh, always use your common sense. Okay, so we're talking about the dependence relationship. Uh, obviously, soft drink consumption can depend on weather temperature, but the opposite can never be true. The weather temperature can never, ever, ever depend on soft drink consumption. Okay. So that's why soft drink consumption is the dependent variable and uh, weather temperature is the independent variable. Okay. The, the problem is if you were to switch the variables, the computer would not complain. You would still get very nice looking results, very legitimate looking results. However, they would be completely meaningless. Okay, so the idea is don't get carried away by numbers or sophisticated equations. Always use your common sense. Does it make sense to you as a person? Okay, so, uh, so let's, let's continue here. So we have the soft drink consumption, for example, is our dependent variable. And uh, we have the uh, weather temperature, and both of them are observed. They are objectively measured uh, quantities. You know, you can measure weather temperature objectively. You can measure uh, soft drink consumption, uh, how many cans of Coke, how many bottles of Coke, etc., have been sold. So these are observed. Okay. And typically, in statistics, observed variables are denoted by English letters. Okay, so X and Y, English letters, they are observed. However, we don't observe, uh, we don't directly observe the effect of the independent variable on the dependent variable. In fact, that's why we're using a regression model to estimate that effect, that relationship. Okay? So unobserved variables are denoted by uh, Greek symbols, Greek letters, alpha, beta, gamma, etc. Okay? So the regression equation looks like this. So it says y equals alpha, okay? So alpha is baseline, okay? It's kind of like our uh, level. Uh, when, if, even if there's nothing, uh, this is our alpha, this is our starting point. And uh, the, the independent variable x has this effect beta, okay? Uh, if x increases by, let's say, one degree, if the weather temperature increases by one degree, okay, this is a slope. If weather temperature increases by one degree, soft drink consumption will increase by beta, 
okay? Uh, and then there's epsilon, okay? Now, epsilon uh, is called the error term. Uh, it's actually not an error, okay? Epsilon is not there by mistake, okay? Epsilon is actually everything that's not uh, uh, covered by the uh, independent variable. So soft drink consumption is definitely affected by multiple factors. However, in this equation, we're looking at a single factor, weather temperature, and everything else, everything else that affects uh, soft drink consumption is plumped into a, a, an error function, okay? So, <clears throat> I, in other words, we could say this is the observed part, this is the unobserved part, okay? This is everything that uh, we explicitly account for. These are everything, uh, this is everything that's not explicitly accounted for, okay? So, again, to summarize, a uh, regression model describes a relationship between two variables or more variables, okay? Where we observe the dependent variable and one or more independent variables, okay? And our estimates tell us how much each independent variable affects the dependent variable. So let's look at some real life data. So I downloaded this data from uh, uh, Bureau of Transportation Statistics. And this data set shows uh, delays, uh, departure delays and arrival delays. So they have uh, observed, they have recorded how late and early flights depart, how late or early flights arrive. Okay? So uh, on a given route uh, for a specific flight uh, on various days. Okay? So uh, this is the data set and I'm looking at the uh, route from Austin to JFK. Okay? So on various days they have recorded the uh, flight uh, early or, uh, arrival delays and departure delays. Okay? So, so the arrival delays are uh, plotted here. So as you can see, uh, sometimes uh, flights arrive early, so negative delay means early arrival. Sometimes uh, flights arrive late. Okay? So the question is, why don't uh, the uh, flights always arrive exactly on time? Okay. Why is there variability in arrival times? If there, if there was no variability in arrival times, you would see all the data points on this uh, vertical uh, horizontal line at zero. However, there's variability in uh, arrival times, sometimes early, sometimes late, and we want to know why. And obvious, one obvious reason is, well, uh, the flight arrived late because it departed late. Or you could say the flight arrived early simply because it departed early. Okay. So here, our dependent variable is arrival delay, and our independent variable is departure delay. 
Now, are these uh, appropriately dependent and independent variables? So, uh, does arrival de delay depend on the de uh, departure delay? Does departure delay depend on arrival delay? Obviously, departure delay happens before, arrival delay happens later. So something that happens before cannot depend on something that happens later. Okay. So, so this is appropriate. So uh, arrival de delay can logically depend on departure delay. Okay. So we estimate the regression model. The regression model shows us uh, oh, before that, so if you look at this, uh, so these are the flights that all departed on time, zero delay in departure. The funny thing is, even though they all uh, departed on time, some of them arrived early and some of them arrived late. Okay. That's, that's interesting, right? Here, these are the flights that have departed one minute late. Again, there is a variability, right? Some of them arrive early, some of them arrive late. Okay, so that's the variability uh, uh, in the data set. So let's look at the uh, regression equation. So the regression equation uh, gives us uh, uh, I would say uh, the best okay I don't want to define best but it gives us the best estimates for alpha and beta okay so our estimate for alpha is minus 3.17 our estimate for beta is 0.9 uh, okay. Epsilon is missing. Okay. So, on average, epsilon is zero. So, the regression model works uh, such that, on average, the epsilon uh, is zero, and we have this uh, equation for the average. Okay, so uh, if departure delay is zero, okay, so let's uh, substitute zero for departure delay, then this term disappears and we have minus 3.17. What this means is that on average, if departure delay is zero, uh, okay, let me put it this way. If a flight departs on time with zero delay, it will uh, uh, arrive 3.17 minutes early on average. Okay, so this is the uh, model for average. Okay? So this is our prediction, this is our forecast. So for a flight that departs on time with zero uh, delay, uh, it arrives 3.17 minutes early on average. Okay. So what happens if a flight departs with 10 minutes of delay? So then uh, uh, we're, we're going to uh, substitute 10, 10 times 0 0.9 uh, minus 3.17 and that will be the uh, expected uh, delay, arrival delay on average. Okay. So this is how uh, the uh, uh, regression equation works. So now uh, point nine. So if if a uh, flight departs one minute late will it also arrive one minute late? Okay, 
if your flight departs, let's say, 10 minutes late, will it arrive 10 minutes late? The regression equation says no. Okay. So the uh, departure delay is not proportionally reflected in the, uh, in the arrival delay and the pilots will make up some time on the flight and uh, only 90% or 0.9, 90% of the uh, departure delay will be reflected in the arrival delay. So, um, as I said, the, when we look at the averages, the average for epsilon is zero, so it goes away, okay? So, the regression model has two, uh, compo two parts. The first part is the uh, deterministic part, okay? Deterministic means non-random, okay? And then it has a uh, stochastic part. Stochastic means random. So if we want a point forecast using the regression model, we use the deterministic part. That gives us a point forecast. However, if we want a range forecast, we need to use the uh, stochastic part. Right. Now, the uh, deterministic part uh, basically uh, explains, okay, so some of the variation in the dependent variable ex is explained by the deterministic part and the error term represents the unexplained part, okay? What do I mean by explained and unexplained? So, this part, the deterministic part, tells us a story, gives us a reason, okay? For example, departure delays affect arrival delays, okay? So there's a logical explanation there, okay? However, there is also the error term. However, the error term is like everything but the kitchen sink. So there's really no explanation there, okay? Nothing is explicitly considered there. So that's the unexplained part, okay? So, So when we go back uh, to our uh, example of departure delays and arrival delays, uh, this regression line is uh, drawn based on the uh, uh, regression equation. And this shows, the regression line shows the explained part of the variation in arrival delay. So let's suppose, let's look at this flight. This flight arrived this late, okay? So this, this is the total variation. This is the uh, tardiness, how late the flight is, okay? Now, this part can be explained by this model, okay? The, the, regret, the, the deterministic part of the uh, regression model explains this much of tardiness, okay? However, there is still this error term which is unexplained, okay? This goes into the error term and this comes from the, uh, uh, from the deterministic part of the regression equation. Now, another way of looking at this is that let's say for uh, flights that 
uh, depart with, a, with two minutes of delay. The average arrival is here. This is the deterministic part of the regression equation, and there is a distribution around this deterministic part, which is the uh, stochastic part of the uh, regression equation. So, uh, in more general terms, the regression equation, the deterministic part, gives you this regression line, okay? And that gives you the averages. It can be a straight line, it can be curved, uh, whatever. And uh, the error term adds the distribution around the uh, uh, regression curve, regression line, to give you a range forecast. Now, here's another uh, example, uh, weight versus height, okay? Here, uh, which one is the dependent variable, which one is the independent variable? So here, uh, weight depends on height, but height doesn't depend on weight. Like, as you gain weight, your height doesn't increase. Okay. But, but uh, height, as you grow taller, you naturally weigh more. Okay. So the relationship here is such that um, uh, a person's height explains or contributes to or affects uh, their weight. Okay. So um, here is a uh, regression line here in the middle. Okay. Uh, there are uh, these observations. Okay. And uh, the regression line gives you the average. Okay. So let's say if you're uh, 55 inches tall, what should a person's uh, average weight be? So you just go up here, okay, this is, so if you, uh, let me, Anyway, I, think, I don't think I can figure this out right now. So, so to find the uh, person's uh, uh, average weight, so for people at this height, the average weight is here. However, some people will be naturally more or less than this weight, and that gives you the range forecast. Okay. So, uh, again, so, uh, 55 inches, okay? This is the point forecast, which is the average weight for people at this height, okay? And, and then you have a range for the mean and a range for a single observation, okay? So, if, okay, another way of interpreting this is if height was the only determining factor for weight, okay? If weight was only affected by height, everybody would be here. Everybody 55 inches tall would be exactly here. However, in addition to height, there are other factors that are uh, all included in the error term, okay? So when you uh, take into account those factors not explicitly considered, then the weight can range uh, above or below this average. Okay. So, in, uh, in, our, in the assignments, I will show you 
how to do this in Excel. Okay, so uh, this is an output from Excel, and this is uh, related to the uh, uh, arrival and departure delay data set. So when you run a regression model in Excel, it gives you an output like this. So uh, there's a lot of information. Uh, however, the most important ones are, uh, are here. So first, uh, it says how many observations have been processed. So our data set had 66 observations and you want to make sure that Excel read all 66 observations, okay? And then, uh, there is uh, R square, okay, R square. R square tells you what percentage of variation in Y is explained by the variation in X. So, uh, arrival times okay. So, so um, uh, arrival delays vary, uh, and departure delays vary. What percentage of uh, arrival delays? can be traced back to departure delays, okay? Our square here is about 5%, which means uh, that 5% of the variation in uh, arrival delays can be accounted for uh, by departure delays, okay? So what this means here in this particular case if you want to reduce depart, uh, if you want to reduce uh, arrival delays, reducing departure delays uh, is only going to help you about five percent. Okay. So this is our estimate for alpha. This is our estimate for beta. And uh, in regression analysis, p-values are very important. However, in forecasting, they're not important. You can safely ignore them. Okay? Uh, so let's uh, build a regression model uh, for a time series data set. Okay? So D is actual demand, maybe sales, uh, at time P. And then you have uh, alpha plus uh, beta times T and epsilon, okay? So uh, as time goes on, uh, as T goes from period one, period two, period three, etc., the sales will increase by uh, beta. So let's say uh, this is our uh, forecasting model. Okay. So uh, in the time series decomposition example, uh, we said, okay, let's say alpha is 80,000, just by rolling, uh, the slope 1,449. So if we use Excel, the regression model in Excel, to estimate uh, a, a line, regression line, we get the following. Okay. So, same data set, and Excel gives us this uh, 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 regression line. Uh, it says simple linear regression because it gives you a straight line. And uh, Excel says, uh, the optimal uh, estimate for level is 81,542, and the optimal uh, trend is 1,651, okay? And this line, okay, this straight line, explains 19% uh, 
of the variation in sales. Now, it's a little bit low because uh, this is a straight line, okay? This does not account for seasonality in the data set. So this uh, regression model, this particular regression model, uh, ignores uh, seasonality and as a result, it does not explain uh, more of the uh, 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 of the variation in sales. Now, sometimes people uh, try to uh, change their regression model to explain more of the data. One thing uh, we could do is we can uh, use uh, the logarithm of time. So instead of uh, one, two, three, four, uh, just enumerating the time periods, you can just say log one, log two, log three, etc. And then it gives you a curve like this, okay? And R square increases from 19% to 25%, just by tweaking the model a little bit. Uh, and we can further play with the model. Let's say instead of a single time variable, we have two time variables. We have t and t squared. Okay. When we include two time variables, t and t squared, r squared goes to 27 percent. Okay. So this model explains more variation in sales. Is this better? Um, not necessarily. In fact, this is a terrible, terrible model. And you might be wondering, well, it explains more. Uh, if the model explains more, how can it be worse? Okay. So let's, let's look at the prediction from this model. The model goes up and then just goes down like this, okay? So this model predicts our sales are going down, okay? However, we know from the data that the sales are going up. And so if you just look at the numbers, they can mislead you. Again, use your common sense, okay? If the data shows the numbers are going up, the numbers are going up, okay? Just because you have a higher R squared doesn't mean this is always better. So I'm going to skip this part. Uh, so let's suppose you're forecasting sales. And uh, as I said, there can be multiple factors that affect sales. So you can use regression analysis to account for all these different factors. Let's say you're trying to forecast sales and you hypothesize that sales depend on price and sales depend on advertising. Very plausible uh, ideas. So we can estimate the following regression model where sales is the uh, dependent variable, and here you have the intercept alpha and you have advertising. So in this model, we're only considering advertising, okay? And advertising explains uh, our square is 0.79, 79% of the variation in sales. Okay, so a, a huge portion of the variance in sales is explained by advertising. Okay, here we're not considering price. So now let's consider price by itself. Okay. Uh, 
Okay, this. There, there's a negative number here. Is that. Okay, is this wrong? No, because what happens is that as price increases, the sales go down. Okay? There's a sales, this has a negative price, has a negative effect on sales. Uh, if you increase price, sales will go down. If, if you decrease price, sales will go up. That's why you have a negative number here. Alpha, beta, okay. So, uh, and the R square is, uh, let's say, 71%. Uh, I'm sorry, 71%. 70, 71 Okay, 75 percent. Okay, so uh, we can uh, build a model which considers both price and advertising. Okay. So when we include uh, two independent variables, this is alpha, this is beta for price, the effect of price is negative, obviously, right? It makes sense. And advertising has a positive effect, again, very, very plausible, okay? And, uh, and then uh, R squared is 93%, so close to 100%. So uh, this is a good model because if you include both price and advertising, it, this model explains 93% of the variation in, uh, in sales. So if you want to uh, predict your sales, okay, uh, okay, and then you might be thinking, okay, what if I increase advertising a little bit and dec decrease the price a little bit? You can uh, play with this model to predict your sales. So, uh, regression analysis is also called causal modeling. We briefly uh, talked about this. Uh, causal because of the dependent independent variable idea. So, uh, why do uh, sales go up or down? Because you increase price or you increase advertising, decrease advertising. So, uh, so this is uh, an example of multiple regression. You can have more explanatory variables. You could say, okay, how many stores do I have? And, you know, holidays, etc. Competitors' prices. So this is an example of uh, the, uh, multiple regression. So uh, p-values and multicollinearity are very important in statistics however in forecasting they don't matter so you can rest assured so let's try to uh, forecast this time series using regression analysis and so far we've used regression analysis to estimate a straight line okay so now this time series is, is very uh, quirky, okay? So uh, this time series has seasonality here, here. This time series has a trend. This time series has a structural break. Like how can a straight line properly uh, represent this time series, right? So if we just uh, use a simple model uh, d sub t equals alpha plus beta times t, a straight line. As you can see, it has an acceptable r square, 52 percent, but obviously it's not a good forecast for this time series. Um, I, I forgot to mention, these are the passenger numbers on this uh, route, uh, Baltimore, Washington to Boston. And these are uh, months, over so many months. Okay, monthly passenger numbers on this route. So the idea is, so what can we do to 
find a better uh, regression model to forecast uh, this time series. One thing we can do is we can add a dummy variable. Okay. Uh, now, a dummy variable, uh, again, I don't know how they come up with these names, but a dummy variable uh, is not a crappy variable. A dummy variable is a very useful variable. It's a binary variable. A dummy variable can be zero or one. Nothing in between. It's either zero or it's one. Okay? So we can improve uh, this uh, regression model by adding a dummy variable. So we have t, okay, t, and then we have a dummy variable. Okay. Dummy variable can be 0 or 1. In this case, dummy variable can be used to indicate before and after the structural break. Okay. So uh, what you will do is you will have the dummy variable equal to 0 all the way up to here. Okay. And from this point onwards, dummy variable will be equal to 1. Okay. So basically, uh, up to here, uh, the level will be alpha. Okay. And then from this point onwards, it's going to be alpha plus the dummy variable. And as you can see, just by adding a simple dummy variable, 0 or 1, binary, uh, the R square increased from 52% to 73%. So now we have accounted for this structural break by just adding one dummy variable. Now let's go further. So uh, before the uh, dummy variable, our uh, forecast was this. So the intercept was uh, 20,258, uh, that's our alpha, and this is our slope for t time period, okay? And then we, when we added the uh, dummy variable, this is our uh, intercept slope, and this is the slope of, or the estimate coefficient of the dummy variable. So before the structural break, the dummy variable will be zero. Okay. Before the structural break, we have this. And after the structural break, we have, uh, this is the intercept alpha plus this, and t times this uh, coefficient. Okay. And that explains 72% uh, of the variation in passenger numbers, okay? So, let's consider another time series. Here, uh, there's seasonality, there's trend, so there's level, okay, there's trend, and then there's seasonality around the trend line, okay? So, again, uh, this is from uh, uh, San Francisco to Boston, monthly passenger numbers, so January 06, January, uh, February 06, March 06, etc. So I have coded time as like one, two, three, four, five. So these are the time periods. One, two, three, four, five. These are the months. And I have around 80, 85 months of data or 82 months of data. Okay. Uh, so this is just the, the, the data set continues after this. So If we run a simple linear regression with only a, a level and trend, uh, this is the alpha intercept level. This is our slope trend. Okay, uh, and that explains about uh, fifty-seven percent of 
uh, the variation in passenger numbers, uh, which is a good start, good as a starting value or, or level. Uh, but how can we add the seasonality around the regression line? Uh, to uh, add seasonality around the regression line, we're going to add a dummy variable for each period. Okay, so the seasonality here is annual. There's an annual pattern, and the pattern repeats itself every 12 months. Okay, so the idea is we're going to have 12 dummy variables representing each period in a year, which repeats itself. Uh, how is this going to work? Uh, here, I'm giving you a quarterly example for space reasons. Let's say uh, we have uh, a quarterly data set. Okay. Uh, so for each quarter, we need a seasonality factor. Okay, because a year has four quarters, and the yearly pattern repeats itself. We need S1, S2, S3, and S4, okay? So the regression equation will give us the level and trend alpha and beta, okay? We're going to have that trend. Uh, to account for seasonality, we need to add S1 to season 1, S1 to period 1, S2 to period 2, S3 to period 3, S4 to period 4, okay? So, for that, uh, we code time as one, two, three, four. These are the periods, okay? And then, uh, we're going to have a dummy variable for period one, dummy variable for period two, dummy variable for period three, and dummy variable for period four. So, in period one, uh, X1 is 1 because we're in period 1 and X2 is 0, X3 is 0, X4 is 0. Okay, so in period 1 only X1 is 1. In period 2 only X2 is 1, X1 is 0, X3 is 0, X4 is 0. In period 3 only X3 is 1. In period 4, only x1, uh, x, x4 is 1, okay? So when we code our data like this, uh, our equation becomes like this. So alpha plus beta times t, okay? Then we add s1, s2, s3, and s4. And you might be wondering, why do we add all four at the same time? Well, we multiply S1 by X1, S2 by X2, S3 by X3, S4 by X4. So here, in period one, we're gonna have alpha plus beta times one. Uh, period two, alpha, beta times two. Period 3, alpha, beta times 3. Period 4, alpha, beta times 4. Okay? So that's the uh, regression line. And then we add seasonality. S1, S2, S3, S4. However, in period 1, only X1 is 1. So we're going to have S1 times 1. And the other seasonality factors will be multiplied by 0. So effectively, by coding our data that, like this, we're only including S1 in period one. In period one, we're not including any of the other seasonality factors. In period two, okay, uh, only X2 is one, so S2 is multiplied by one. However, S1, 
is multiplied by zero, is three multiplied by zero, is four multiplied by zero, so they don't uh, count. Only S2 is added to our regression line. Similarly, in period three, only S3 is one, is multiplied by one. So this is how we use dummy variables to add seasonality okay, on top of the regression line. So here, uh, in the example of uh, San Francisco to Boston, uh, the uh, calendar months here, uh, passenger numbers, and uh, the period, one, two, three, four, five, etc. And then this data set continues. Uh, so, so we have uh, 12 dummy variables, M1 for month one, M2 for month two, etc. These are dummy variables. They can only be zero or one, nothing else. So uh, first, uh, uh, period M1 is 1, all other M's are 0, in month 2, M2 is 1, and then M3 goes up like this, okay? And in period 13, okay, so 12 uh, periods have passed, the first annual pattern has ended, the second annual pattern is starting from 13, okay? And then we start at M1 again, M2, M3, etc. Goes on like this, and then uh, continues like that. Okay. So, so this is how we code the data. So uh, T gives us the uh, straight line, regression line, and M1 through M12 are going to add us add the seasonality around the uh, trend line. Okay. So here's the Excel output. So this is intercept is alpha plus trend, okay, slope. And then these are the monthly seasonality factors. Okay. One thing you may notice is uh, M12 is missing. We have 12 months, right? So we have 12 months and 12 dummy period, uh, dummy variables. However, uh, you always leave out one of the dummy variables because it's too much. Why? Because uh, if you know M1 through M11, you can you already know M12. So M12 is unnecessary actually okay so if these are all zero then you know m12 must be one or if any of these is one then you automatically know m12 is zero right so m12 is not necessary so we just drop m12 okay so uh what does this look graphically uh, when we add seasonality to the trend line, it looks like this, okay? And this is a very, very good model. I think our square is 92%. Our square, yeah, 92%. So, can we, okay, going back to our data here, so we have added this structural break with a single uh, dummy variable, can we also add uh, seasonality to this uh, model, to this uh, situation? Okay. So, uh, okay. so here's an example of this. So, uh, we have this data, uh, this seasonality, okay? 
Uh, we have trend, we have seasonality, uh, and then uh, when we estimate this model with trend and seasonality, okay, so this is uh, alpha level trend, okay, uh, regression line, and this is the seasonality part, okay. I mean, this looks good, relatively good, but it's just a little bit off, right? So uh, there's a uh, structural break here. Uh, the seasonality looks okay, but you know, just it's a little bit off. We can do many things to improve this. One of them is, how about uh, let's include a dummy variable for each year. Okay, that means for each year, we're going to have a different level, okay? So we could include a single dummy variable for this structural break. That would help, but it would be even better if we uh, readjusted the level every year, okay? So uh, let me see. Uh, here uh, we have data from 2006, 2007, 8, 9, 10, up to 2012, okay? So uh, what we can do is we have the passenger numbers and then we have the period, 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, etc. And then we have dummy variables that show uh, month, M1 through M12, okay? And for each year, we can have one dummy variable. So uh, Y2006 okay, uh, indicates the year 2006. All other year dummy variables are zero. And then we have Y2007 here. All other uh, year variables are zero, etc. cetera. Okay. Uh, we could do that. And when we do that, uh, the uh, time or, or, or year dummy variables are added to the model. Okay. Uh, so before the year dummy variables, So after the dummy variables have been added to the model, you can see each year is fit independently, okay? And each year fits much, much better. However, you see there's a, this is a little bit off around the uh, structural break. We can still add the structural break uh, variable here, but otherwise, the uh, individual years look good here and here, just in the middle there's this uh, structural break. So, so, we have seen how to use dummy variables for months and for years. Uh, what can you do if you have weekly data? Can you use dummy variables for weekly data? The answer is definitely yes. So let's suppose you have a weekly data here, you have these uh, demand figures here, year 2015, etc. continues like this. So a uh, week number, week number goes from one to uh, through 52. You have month one, month two, month three, month four. And then uh, in each month, you can have four or five uh, weeks. So uh, week uh, one of month one, week two of month one, three of month one, four of uh, month one, five. So these are the weeks 
one, two, three, four, one, two, three, four, one, two, three, four, etc. So one thing you can do here is you can uh, define a dummy variable for each week, one through 52. So you will have, uh, I mean, this is just uh, this continuous here, you will have 52 dummy variables, one for each week. Or if you don't want to have as many dummy variables, what you can do is instead of coding each week, you can look uh, each, at each month. Okay, so you can have 12 monthly dummy variables. So this is uh, month one, month two, month three, month four, etc. And within each month, you can have week one, two, three, four, five. Second month, one, two, three, four, uh, and then uh, week th uh, month three, week one, week two, week three, week four, month four, week one, week two, week three, week four, etc. This is another way of coding uh, weekly data. You can think of uh, other ways of coding weekly data. So if you go uh, with monthly and weekly variables, so you're, you're going to have uh, 12 months, 12 dummy variables for months, and five dummy variables for weeks. Okay. Uh, so, so I'd like to stop here. Uh, we've seen many different ways uh, of using regression analysis in uh, forecasting a linear trend or a, uh, a time series with trend and seasonality. Thank you all for watching.